Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out this podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, the Fair for Uber Car Program. Don't get stuck putting all those miles and depreciation on your personal vehicle. Instead, check out the Fair for Uber Car Program. I used the program for 10 weeks. It was super simple, and Fair even arranged for Uber to pick me up at my home and drive me to my new car, which was a nice Hyundai Elantra for $195 per week plus taxes. That price includes the car, plus your rideshare insurance, and best of all, unlimited miles. Now, when you compare this program to Lyft's program, the cost for the car is less and the bonuses are more. The program is available in California for now, but there are other programs all across the country. So check the FAIR website for prices in your market. Some drivers are even getting their first week for free. So check it out, download the FAIR app, get a car today. It's a great program. And be sure to use our code, which is RSG100, RSG100, so we get credit for sending you there. All right? All right. Let's start the show. Welcome to the Rideshare Dojo. If you're an Uber or Lyft driver or anyone in the gig economy, this is the place for you. With tips and techniques, interviews with passengers and industry leaders, entertainment, inspiration, motivation. Here, with over 23,000 rides, is your host, Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. Hey, everybody. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Instacart drivers, Postmates, Ease, Zoom drivers, DoorDash, Via, Amazon Prime, Amazon Prime Now, Uber Eats, Grubhub, all you drivers and passengers and all of us who are part of this big, beautiful gig economy, welcome. It is so great to have you here for today's exciting episode. My name is Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. Hey, everybody out there driving on the roads, you awesome drivers, men and women, the rideshare drivers out there making it happen, doing what you got to do, preparing for Thanksgiving. Got Thanksgiving coming up in a few days. And uh, yeah, the sun's shining here in California. And uh, let's, let's get this done. So today I'm going to talk about uh, Juno, which I actually didn't know much about uh, until a few days ago when they shut down. And I'm also going to cover a couple of other topics. But let's, uh, let's start with this whole Juno thing, right? So what do we know about Juno? So Juno is a uh, rideshare company that re- recently just shut it down. They sent emails out to its drivers in New York City. They, they, they launched and they only were in New York, in, in America, in New York, saying that that's it. Uh, you can't drive for Juno any longer. So Juno launched its ride-sharing service in New York City in 2016. And then Juno was acquired by a company called Get, G-E-T-T, a year later in 2017, for $200 million. And then Juno ceases all transportation operations on November 18th. That was yesterday at six in the afternoon, six in the evening, right? Uh, So this was a uh, death of a, a true driver partner company. So when this company launched, they had a lot of promise a lot of promise. Um, higher rates for the drivers. A tipping option for the drivers. This is before Uber had a tipping option. And 24-7 phone support before Uber and Lyft had 24-7 phone support. So these are some great things, right? Uh, and then they also charged a little bit less for their rides. But they really had no, the big problem that they ran, ran into was they had no real point of difference with Uber and Lyft from the consumer's perspective. Other than a little bit l- less in price, um, you know, Uber and Lyft do a pretty, pretty damn good job. If you're a passenger, it's great, right? We've all used it. You just, uh, you know, 
just click on the app, put in the destination and boom, you know, you're going to have someone come and pick you up. And nine times out of 10, that's how it works. It's a, it's a great, it's a great system. So it's difficult for anyone to come into a market and, and um, do something better, right? Do something that really makes people say, oh, I want to use them, you know, instead of a uh, Uber or Lyft. Um, so that was the problem that, that they, that they ran into. Um, one, one thing that they also did, did not have, uh, which was good for them was no, no surge fares. So their rates always stayed the same. So they, so basically they were trying to compete on price and in the end that didn't work because Uber and Lyft are pretty cheap, right? Cause they're subsidized by, by venture capital and now by stock money and, um, and that's uh, it, just, it's a diff very difficult, difficult market. Um, so New York City, that's where they did it. It's a tough market. Um, right now, Uber and Lyft are doing a lockout, which means they're not even hiring new drivers. So there is an option if you're in New York called Via, okay? And uh, I'll read what I know about uh, Via. While Juno competed head-on with Uber and Lyft, Via is different. Um, this is from our own, the rideshare guy. Via drivers get paid to shuttle multiple passengers who are headed in a similar direction. You stop only to pick up and drop off on corners. Passengers then walk to their final destination. So it's like rideshare. This makes rides much more efficient for drivers. Losing Juno and Juno's subsequent partnership with Lyft further cements the Uber-Lyft duopoly for contractor driving work. Fewer choices for drivers can only mean that there will be less pressure for the companies to increase driver pay. That's for sure. At the Rideshare Guy, we like that Via is paying higher rates, and we hope Via succeeds, if for no other reason than to motivate Uber and Lyft to re retain drivers with better pay and treatment. Via is operating in select U.S. markets, but it is in uh, New York. All right. Now, if we go to the the, the news, uh, we can see TechCrunch uh, wrote a nice article about Juno's demise, and uh, I'll just... Uh, quote a little bit here. The acquisition spearheaded a big effort to catch up and potentially even surpass the two biggest ride-hailing companies in the market, Uber and Lyft. At a time when many people were starting to question some of Uber and Lyft's practices in the market, Juno, started by the founders of the messaging app Viber, tried to take a, a different approach to the market by putting drivers and their compensation front and center, thereby hoping to attract more of them to its platform and also more riders happier with the ethics of the different approach. At the same time, Get took a different approach to its competitors by focusing only on specific markets to cut down operating expenses and turn a profit. It made it um, as far as being a solid number three in the in the words of Razor earlier this year, and that was it. So um, I've often thought in San Francisco, if I started a rideshare company and uh, our, our whole pitch was our rates are a little higher, but we pay the drivers 90%. And uh, we treat that we give them certain you know benefits, and uh, as they accrue rides, you know they get they get a higher percentage. Um, actually, I wrote an article about this. What my my dream uh, rideshare company would look like? You know, you started at like eighty percent, and then once you hit to like twenty thousand trips, then it went up to like ninety percent, and um, and and the, and the pitch for the consumer was that. We're not screwing the drivers. The drivers are actually, you know, benefiting by working with us. So it's kind of like we treat them well. So so drive with us because we're ethical. Um, we're not out to screw the drivers the way Uber and Lyft uh, have demonstrated, you know, year after year after year. Um, apparently, that didn't work. That that did not work in New York. So uh, I guess that wasn't such a great idea after all. But it's something to consider, you know. How, how does a how could a company compete with Uber and Lyft? You know, what what could you how could you make a rideshare uh, company different? Actually, not different, better than Uber and Lyft. That's a that's a hard question, and so far nobody's come up with a, with a good answer. Via seems to be doing something that's working, and that they're more like a carpool, um, and because of that, it's more efficient for the drivers. And, um, and, and for the company, because the passengers walk to a, a, a location and um, because there's more of them, they can pay less. 
and that seems to to be working so far. So maybe V is onto something. Um, definitely go to the the rideshare guy, and you can read the article about Juno. And if you're interested in signing up for Via, um, there's a link there that you can uh, sign up with. So <clears throat> Juno had a lot of promise. They made a lot of promises, but in the end, it's just a big disappointment. And Uber and Lyft are still going strong. All right, I'm going to cover just two other little stories. Um, Uber recently purchased a company called Kareem. And uh, Kareem is a, uh, a company. That, so Uber announced the major acquisition paying $3 billion for the Dubai-based ride-share, uh, ride-sharing service Kareem, giving many investors hope that the Middle East and North Africa could represent a major growth opportunity for the company. Kareem's deep knowledge of the local market has helped it gain a loyal user base of 33 million and allowed it to expand to 87 cities and 14 countries, including places like Iraq and Palestine, where Uber previously had no presence. So a lot has been made about how Uber and Lyft aren't profitable. And I've I've now said many times that I think Uber is going to figure it out. And um, they, they, I, did, I spoke to you about Uber money as a way that they could move towards some profitable uh, business. And here it looks like they're by uh, expanding their reach um, where they don't have much competition uh, and purchasing Kareem. That's another venture into profitability. So Uber's going to keep throwing enough shit up against the wall until something sticks, right? Um, much the way that Amazon did, you know, Amazon wasn't profitable when it started. And, uh, you know, then they did Amazon prime, huge hit. Now they're in all kinds of stuff and they're doing great. And Jeff Bezos is one of the richest men in the world. So give it time. I think Uber's going to figure it out. Okay. All right. This is a really interesting story. So I, um, I, I read a, a blog called the points guy. Not that I have any points. I, I, I just, uh, I travel a lot. And uh, it's interesting just to see what's going on with with the different cards. And um, this uh, article is, um, it says, uh, why I now avoid ride-hailing services whenever I can. So I don't know if this is the beginning of a trend or not, but he makes some really good points. And I'm going to share with you the way some people are starting to think about um, Uber and Lyft. So first is the cost. So he brings up about six points here. So... The first is the cost. And he says, when Uber launched, I remember that it was distinctly more affordable than taxi rides, in some cases by a wide margin. However, when I look at ride prices now, I rarely see good deals compared to to hailing a traditional taxi or my latest strategy, renting a car. So he's speaking to the fact that rates have gone up. There are less discounts now for, uh, for passengers. And oftentimes, uh, taking a taxi or renting a car is more cost effective. His next gripe is airport pickups. And I I will say that yes, uh, airport pickups are difficult, right? You have to walk to a certain location at many airports now. There's lines, it can take the the rideshare cars, the Uber and Lyft drivers, you know, a long time to get to make the pickups. Now, some airports uh, have the pin system which is just basically duplicating what the way a taxi works, right? Where there's a line of cars and you take the first car that's in line. So here again, it comes down to cost and convenience. And on many airports now, Uber and Lyft are neither uh, cost effective nor efficient. Wait times, next gripe, wait times. So uh, when you're going to get picked up by a car um, can sometimes take a long time, right? The apps are not always accurate. In fact, he says here, I have found the driver arrival estimation in both the Uber and Lyft app so inaccurate that I call a ride before even departing my hotel room, and I anticipate double of whatever the app suggests. Now, I've never had this experience. I, um, I've i definitely had a, a car that just seemed to not move for a while. Um, but in general, when they say they're going to be there in eight minutes, they're there in eight minutes. So... I've not had the same situation, and I've done a, you know, a lot of passenger trips, so um, I don't agree with him on that one. Wait times. Driver games, the next gripe. Driver games, all right? So this is for all you drivers out there who kind of do these bullshit little games, 
And, um, you know, uh, what's happening is some passengers don't like it and they may stop using, using the ride service. So while the games driver, this is what he says, while the games drivers can play come in a wide variety, ranging from devious to simple, all of them can make your ride hailing experience expensive or inefficient. And that's really the thing, inefficient. You want the car to come and you want to get your ride. My least favorite is a driver that does not want to pick you up and will just sit in a single place until you cancel, at which point you're hit with a cancellation fee. This wastes an incredible amount of time, and then you start all over trying to find another driver. Drivers can also go in circuitous routes or hit you with the bogus cleaning fees. So if you're doing that, don't do that. These are, these are just things that give rideshare driving a bad name. If you don't want to pick the person up, cancel, right? You can get close, see what the destination is. If you don't want to pick them up, cancel. Don't just go sit and and and, and time out. And uh, yeah, I've never even heard of people hitting with bogus cleaning fees. Um, so, um, and I'm not the first uh, TPF staffer to be fed up with this, as Brian Kelly, another person with um, the points guy, um, had, had enough last year after falling victim to these cancellation scams and to their to their be- to their uh, merit they say now i know there are thousands of hard working drivers out there who are hustling every day to make a paycheck and they do it in a friendly and professional manner it's a shame a select few spoil it for everyone yeah so i would agree with that don't play games if you're going to cancel cancel let them find another ride um, and really the solution would be for Uber and Lyft to tell us what the destination is when, when we first get the ping, and then we can decide if we want to take the ride or not. And it wouldn't be hard for them to, you know, let's say it's let's say it's a ride that many drivers aren't going to want. It just goes ping. Okay, I see it. I don't want it. Cancel. Next driver sees it. I don't want it. I cancel. Next driver, I see it. I don't want it. Cancel. Okay, let's say four, four canceled. That would take a minute, you know, and then somebody would say, oh, okay. That's heading towards my home. I want to go. I want to take that ride. So it would be so much more efficient, I believe, if we knew the destination ahead of time, and then we could just cancel. That way, that way, they, we wouldn't be playing these games at all. All right. The next uh, gripe is customer service. So I've not ever had an issue uh, contacting Uber and Lyft with an issue. Um, and when I have, for example, when I got a cancellation fee and I didn't deserve it, they immediately refunded it. So um, not been my experience. And that's it. So bottom line, this, uh, this um, author says, my experience riding a train, taking a bus, calling a taxi, or renting a car is now vastly superior to using a ride-hailing service. In Chicago, I fly to Midway and take a 29-minute subway into the city. In New York, I fly to Newark and ride the train to Penn Station, where I can take the subway anywhere in the city for 275 and no traffic. In Charlotte, and pretty much anywhere else I go, I rent a car. I save money, avoid the pickup hassle, and can go the second I want to go compared to using ride-hailing apps around the destination. Simply put, I found these services are now too much of a headache, too expensive, and too inefficient for them to make sense for the majority of my travels. So this guy speaks truth to power, right? So he's saying exactly the way things are, and but but... He's unusual in that he's going to, you know, take action and and do it. Most people are lazy. And rather than taking that extra step to rent a car or to take the subway, they're going to go the easier route, which is to use an Uber and a Lyft, pay a little extra, wait a little extra time, but it's easier. And that's the thing. That's the thing. So that's why Uber and Lyft are going to continue because it's a great service. And yeah, it's got some problems, but it's easy. And even though it might cost a little bit more than these other uh, ways to get around town, it's easier. You don't have to drive. You don't have to worry about insurance. You don't have to worry about getting into an accident. You don't have to worry about getting on a train with a whole bunch of other people. It's, uh, there's the safety issue. There's, there's all kinds of issues that come up when you do these other forms of transportation. Whereas when you just call an Uber and a Lyft, the car comes, you get in, it's just you. You drive, you get dropped off right to your door. No fuss, no muss. So good for him for, uh, you know, taking the initiative and, and, and finding other ways to get around that work for him. Uh, but I think for most people, we're just, uh, we prefer simplicity. We prefer comfort and we don't mind paying a little bit extra for it.
So that's what I say on that one. All right. Okay, guys. So that's it for today. Um, next Thursday will be Thanksgiving. I'm going to play a little Thanksgiving holiday music for you at the beginning of the podcast episode. And I'm going to share with you something that happened this last weekend on Saturday, which was my longest trip ever. So just think about that. 26,000 miles. And just now I had the, my longest trip ever. And I took it. And I'm going to share with you how that went, what I learned, why I did it, and how much money I made. So I'll see you next Thursday. You guys are awesome. You rock. Drivers are the best human beings on the planet Earth. You go out and make it a great day. And uh, be safe out there. And I'll talk to you next week. If you're thinking about starting an online business, definitely check out my website at nomadj.com where you can get my free ebook called What's Next? How to Do Online Work You Love from Anywhere in the World. That is nomadjay.com. I also do a daily one minute per day podcast called Nomad Daily in which I share different aspects of life. Uh, Nomad Daily with Jay Creator is available wherever you get your podcasts. People are really liking it. Check it out. You just uh, subscribe and then every day you're just going to it's going to automatically load up and you're going to get the next episode and you just listen for a minute to a minute and a half and boom, you're done. And uh, it's great. I really enjoy doing that. All right. Next episode, more news, interviews, all things Rideshare Dojo for drivers and all of us in the gig economy. I will do my best to bring you the best here in the dojo. This is Jay Crater saying thanks for entering the dojo every Monday and Thursday. Drive happy and be safe out there. Loved this episode of the Rideshare Dojo podcast? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps and it's very much appreciated. Be sure to visit RideshareDojo.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Thanks for listening and be safe out there.